Out of the Closet, a collection of early LGBTQ plus fiction. Pearl Hunting in a Pomatis. The Great Western ducked in a heavy swell, shipping her regular deck load of salt water every six minutes. Now the Great Western was nothing more nor less than a 17 ton schooner, two hours out from Tahiti. She was built like an old shoe and shoveled in a head sea as though it was her business. It was something like sea life, wading along her submerged deck from morning till night, with a piece of raw junk in one hand and a briny biscuit in the other. We never could keep a fire in that galley, and as for her tack, the sooner it got soaked through, the sooner it was off our minds, for we knew to this complexion it must shortly come. Two hours out from Tahiti we settled our course, wafting a theatrical kiss or two towards the glorious green pyramid we were turning our backs on, as it slowly vanished in the blue desert of the sea. A thousand palm crowned and foam girdled reefs spangle the ocean to the north and east of Tahiti. This train of lovely satellites is known as the Dangerous Archipelago, or more commonly in that latitude, the Pomato Islands. It's a very hotbed of coconut oil, palms, half famished kanakas, shells, and shipwrecks. The currents are rapid and variable. The winds short, sharp, and equally unreliable. If you would have adventure, the real article and plenty of it, make your will. Bid farewell to home and friends and embark for the pomatus. I started on this principle, and repented knee-deep into the deck-breakers, as we butted our way through the billows, bound for one of the pomatus on a pearl hunt. Three days I sat in sackcloth and salt water. Three nights I swashed in my greasy bunk, like a solitary sardine in a box with the side knocked out. In my heart's of heart I prayed for deliverance. You see, there is no backing out of a schooner, unless you crave death in fifty fathoms of phosphorescent liquid and a grave in a shark's maw. Therefore, I prayed for more wind from the right quarter, for a sea like boundless mail pond. In short, for speedy deliverance on the easiest terms possible. Notwithstanding, we continued to bang away at the great waves that crooked their backs under us and hissed frightfully as they enveloped the great western with spray until the fourth night out, when the moon gladdened us and promised much while we held our breath in anxiety. We were looking for land. We've been looking for three hours, scarcely speaking all the time. It's a serious matter, raising a pometer by moonlight. Land, squeaked a weak voice about six feet above us. A lank fellow, with his legs corkscrewed around the shrouds, and his long neck stretched to windward, where he weird like a weathercock in a nor'wester, chuckled as he sung out, Land! And he felt himself a little lower than Christopher Columbus thereafter. Where away, bellowed our chunky little captain as important as if he were commanding a grown-up ship. Two points on the weather bow, piped the lookout, with the voice of one soaring in the space, but unhappily choked in the last word by a sudden lurch of the schooner that brought him speedily to the deck, where he lost his identity and became a proper noun, second person, singular, for the rest of the cruise. Now, two points is an indefinite term that embraces any obstacle ahead of anything, but the weather bow has been the salvation of many a craft in her distress, so we gave three cheers for the weather bow, and proceeded to sweep the horizon with unwinking gaze. We could scarcely tell how near the land might be. Fancy we could already hear the roar of surf barren reefs, and every wave that reared before us seemed the rounded outline of an island. Of course, we shortened sail, not knowing at what moment we might find ourselves close upon some low sea garden, nestling under the rim of breakers that fenced it in, and being morally averse to running it down without warning. It was scarcely midnight. The moon was radiant. We were silently watching, wrapped in a deep mystery that hung over the weather bow. Wind suddenly abated. It was as though it sifted through trees and came to us subdued with a whisper of fluttering leaves and a breath of spice. We knew what it meant, and our hearts leaved within us, as over the bow loomed the wave-like outline of shadow that sank not again like the other waves, and it floated off cloud-like, but seemed to be bearing steadily upon us. A great whale hungry for modern Jonah. What a night it was! We heard the howl of waters now, saw the palm boughs glistened in the moonlight, and the glitter and the flash of foam that fringed the edges of the half-drowned islet. It looked for all the world like a grove of cocoa trees that had waded out of sight of land, but didn't know which way to turn next. This was the ultima thule of the Great Western's voyage, and she seemed to know it, for she behaved splendidly at last, laying off and on till morning in fine style, evidently as proud as a ship of line. I went below and dozed, with the low roar of the reef quite audible, a fellow gets used to such dream music and sleeps well to its accompaniment. At daybreak, we began beating up against wind and tide, hoping to work into smooth water by sunrise, which did easily enough, shaking hands all round over a cup of thick coffee and molasses 
the three fathoms of chain whizzed overboard after a tough little anchor that buried itself in a dim wilderness of corals and seagrass. Then and there I looked above me with delighted eyes. The great western rolled anchor in shallow lake, whose crystal depths seemed never to have been agitated by any harsher breath than at that moment kissed without ruffling its surface. Around us swept amphitheater of hills, covered with a dense grove of tropical foliage, and cut into the hem of the beach with thick sod of exquisite tint and freshness. The narrow rim of beach that sloped suddenly to the tideless margin of the lake was littered with numberless slender canoes drawn out of the water like so many fish, as though they could navigate themselves in the natural element, and they were, therefore, not to be trusted alone too near it. Around the shore, across the hills, and along the highest ridges, waved innumerable cocoa palms, planted like a legion of lances about the encampment of some barbaric prince. As for the very blue sky and the very white scud that shot across it, it looked windy enough. Moreover, we could all hear the incoherent booming of the sea upon the reef that encircled our nest. But we forgot the wind and the waves in the inexpressible repose of the armful of tropical seclusion. It was a drop of water in a tuft of moss, on a very big scale. That's just what it was. In a few moments, as with one impulse, the canoes took to water with a savage or two in each, all gravitating to the schooner, which was for the time being the head centre of the local commerce. And for an hour or more, we did a big business in exchange of fish hooks and fresh fruit. The proportional canoes at Motuhilo, Crescent Island, to the natives of said fragment of Eden, was as one to several. But the canoeless could not resist the superior attraction of a foreign invader. Therefore, the rest of the inhabitants went head first into the lake and struck out for the middle, where it peacefully swung at anchor. The place was shaky, but a heavy dirk full twenty inches tall was held between the teeth of the swimmers, and if the smoke called dorsal of any devil, of a shark had dared to cut the placid surface of the water that morning, he would speedily have had more blades in him than a farrier's knife. A few vigorous strokes of the arms and legs in the neighbourhood, a fatal lunge or two, a vermilion cloud in a sea churned to a cream, and a dance over the gaping corpse of some monster who has sucked human blood more than once, probably, does the business in that country. It was a sensation for accustomed eyes, that inland sea-covered, littered, I may say, with woolly heads, as though a cargo of coconuts had been thrown overboard in a stress of weather. They gathered about as thick as flies at a honeypot, all talking, laughing, and spreading mouthfuls of water into the air like those impossible creatures that do that sort of thing by the half dozen in all high-toned and classical fountains. Out of this amphibious mob, one gigantic youth, big enough to eat half a ship's crew, threw up an arm like Joe's, clinched the deck rail with lithe fingers, and took a rest, swinging there with the utmost satisfaction. I asked him aboard, but he scorned to forsake his natural element. Water is as natural as air to those natives. Probably he would have suffered financially had he attempted boarding us, for his thick back hair was netted with a kind of spacious nest and filled with eggs on tail. It was quite astonishing to see the ease with which he navigated under his heavy deck load. This colossal youth, having observed that I was an amateur humanitarian, virtue received its instant reward, which it does in all climates, for he at once offered me three of his eggs in a very winning and patronizing manner. I took the eggs because I like eggs, and then I was anxious to get his head above water if possible. Therefore, I unhesitatingly took the eggs, offering him in return a fish hook, a tenpenny nail, and a dilapidated keyring. These tempting curios he spurned, at the same moment reaching me another handful of eggs. His generosity both pleased and alarmed me. I saw with joy that his chin was quite out of water in consequence of his charity. Even when he dropped back into the sea, floating for a few moments, so as to let the blood circulate in his arm again. But whether this was his magnanimous gift, or merely a trap to involve me in hopeless debt, I was quite at loss to know, and I paused with my hands full of eggs, saying to myself, There is an end to fish hooks in the South Pacific, and dilapidated key rings are not my staple product. In the midst of my alarm, he began making vows of eternal friendship. This was by no means disagreeable to me. He was big enough to whip any two of his fellows, and one likes to be on the best side of the stronger party in a strange land. I reciprocated. I leaned over the stern rail of the Great Western in the light shade of Juliet in the balcony scene, assuring that Elroy that my heart was his if he was willing to take it at second hand. He liked my sentiments, and proposed touching noses at once, a barbarous greeting still observed in most civilized countries, with even greater lessons, since with Christians it is allowable to touch mouths. We touched noses, though I was in danger of sliding headlong into the sea. After this ceremonial, he consented to board the Great Western, which having accomplished with my help, he deposited his eggs at my feet, offered me his nose once more, and communicated to me his name, asking in the same breath for mine. He was known as Huamano, or bird's egg. Every native in the South Sea gets named by accent. I know a fellow whose name was Kokai, 
He was a standing advertisement of his physical deformity. I felt that Naomi rejoiced in a single cognomen of thrown from a horse. Fortunately, he doesn't spell it with so many letters in his tongue. His christening happened in this wise. A bosom friend of his mother was thrown from a horse and killed the day of his birth. Therefore, the bereaved mother reared that child and animated a memorial, who in after years clothed me, and was so jolly as though his earthly mission wasn't simply to keep green the memory of his mother's bosom friend, sailing through the air with a dislocated neck. I turned to my newfound friend. Juan Mano, I said. For my sake, you have made a bird's nest of your back hair. You have freely given me your young affection and your eggs. Receive the sincere thanks of your surely, together with these fish hooks, these tiny pen nails, this keyring. Juan Mano smiled and accepted, bearing the fish hooks in his matted forelock and inserting a ten penny nail and a key ring inside the ear, thereby making himself the envy of the entire population of Motuhilo and feeling himself as grand as the best chief in the archipelago. So we sat together on the deck of the Great Western, quite dry for a wonder, exchanging sheep sighs and confidences, mutually happy in each other's society. Meanwhile, the captain was arranging his plans for an immediate purchase of such pearls as he might find in possession of the natives, and for a fresh search for pearl oysters at the earliest possible hour. There were no pearls on hand. What are pearls to a man who has as many wives, children and coconuts as he can dispose of? Pearls are small and coralless. Give them a handful of gorgeous glass beads, a stick of ceiling wax, or some spotted beans, and keep your pale sea tears, milky and frozen, and have to grow sickly yellow and die if they are not cared for. Montehilo is an abandoned. No man has squatted there to levy tax or toll. We were each one of us privileged to hunt for pearls and keep our stories separate. I said to Juan Mano, let's invest in a canoe, explore the lagoon for fresh oyster beds, and fill innumerable cocoa shells with these little white seeds. It would be both pleasant and profitable, particular for me. We were scarcely five minutes bargaining for our outfit, and we embarked at once, having agreed to return in a couple of days for news concerning success of the Great Western and her probable date of sailing. Seizing a paddle, Juan Mano propelled a canoe with incredible rapidity out of a noisy fleet in the center of the lake, to where a green point abandoned it, one of the horns of the crescent. He knew a spot where the oyster yawned in profusion, a secret cave for shelter, a forest garden of fruits, never failing spring, etc. Thither we would fly and domesticate ourselves. The long curved point of land soon hid the inner waters from you. We rose and sank on the swell between the great reef and the other rim of the island, where the sun glowed fiercely overhead and the reef howled in our ears. Still on we skimmed, the water hissing along the smooth sides of the canoe, that trembled at every first stroke of Juan Manu's industrious paddle. No chart, no compass, no rudder, no exchange of references, no letter of introduction, but I trusted the wild Hercules who was hurrying me away, I knew not whither, with an earnestness that forced the sweat from his naked body in living streams. At last we turned our prow and shot through a low arch in a cliff, so low we both ducked our heads instinctively, letting the vines and parasites trail over our shoulders and down our backs. It was a dark passage into an inner cave lit from below, a cave filled with an eternal and sunless twilight. It was very soothing to our eyes as we came in from the glare of sea and sky. Look, said Juan Mano. Overhead rose a compressed dome of earth, a thick matting of roots, coil within coil. At the side, innumerable ledges, shelves and seams, lined with nests, and never a nest without a sec, often two or more together. Below us, in two fathoms of crystal, sunlit and luminous bowers of coral, and many an oyster asleep with its mouth open, and many a prismatic fish poising itself with palpitating gills, and gauzy fins fanning the water incessantly. Juan Manu, I exclaimed in rapture, permit me to congratulate you. In you I behold a regular South Sea Monte Cristo, and no less magnificent title can do you justice. The right Juan Manu laughed immoderately, which laugh having run out, we both sat in our canoe and silently sucked eggs for some moments. A canoe length for where we floated, a clear rill stole noiselessly from above, mingling its sweet waters with the sea. On the roof of our cabin, fruits flourished, and we were wholly satisfied. After such a lunch as ours, it behooved us to cease idling and dive for pearls. So Juan Manu nodded his long hair tightly above his forehead, cautiously transferred himself from the canoe to the water, floated a moment, inhaling a wonderfully long breath, and plunged under. How he struggled to get down to the gaping oysters, literally climbing down head first. I saw his dark form wrestling with the elements that strove to force him back to the surface, curl him out into the air again. He seized one of the shells, but it shut immediately, and he tugged and jerked and wrenched it like a young demon till it gave way, when he struck out and up for air. All this seemed an age to me. I took full twenty breaths while he was down. Reaching the canoe, he dropped a great, ugly-looking thing into it and hung over the outrigger, grasping for breath like a man half-hanged. He was pale about the mouth. His eyes were suffused with blood, blood oozed from his ears and nostrils, his limbs gashed with the sharp corals, blood also.
The veins of his forehead looked ready to burst, and as he tightened the cords of his hair across them, it seemed his only salvation. I urged him to desist, seeing his condition and fearing repetition of his first experience, but he would go once more. Perhaps there was no pearl in the shell. He wanted to get me a pearl. He sank again, renewed his efforts at the bottom of the sea. I scarcely dared to count the minutes now, nor the bubbles that came up to me, like little balloons with a death message in each. Suppose he was to send his last breath in one of those transparent globes, and I looked down to see his body snared in the antlers of coral, stained with blood. Well, he came up all right, and I postponed the rest of my motion, for a later experience. Some divers remain three minutes under water, but two or three descents are as many as they can make in a day. The ravages of such a life are something frightful. No more pearl hunting of the second dive that day, nor the next, because we went out into the air for a stroll and shore to gather fruit and stretch our legs. There was a high wind and a heavy sea that looked threatening enough, and we were glad to return after an hour's tramp. The next day was darker, and the next after that, when a gale came down upon us that seemed likely to swamp Monte Hilo. A swell rolled over the windward reef and made our quarters in the grotto by no means safe or agreeable. It was advisable for us to think of embarking upon an impetuous sea or get brained against the roof of our retreat. Poor Mano looked troubled, and my heart sank. I wished the pearl oysters at the bottom of the sea, to get west and back at Tahiti, and I, loafing under the green groves of Papit, never more to be deluded abroad. I observed no visible changes in the weather, as I had been wishing for an hour and a half. The swell rather increased. Our frail canoe was tossed from side to side, in imminent danger of setting. Now and then a heavy roar entirely filled the mouth of our cabin, quite blinding us with spray. Having spent its fury, it subsidized with a concussion that nearly deafened us, and dragged us with fearful velocity towards the narrow mouth of the cave, where we saved ourselves from being swept into the sea by grasping the roots of our head and within reach. Could I swim? I asked Kuamano. Alas, no. But we must seek new shelter at any risk was but too evident. Let us go on the next wave, said Hua, as he seized the large shell and began clearing the canoe of the water that had accumulated. Then he bound his long hair in a knot to keep it from his eyes, and gave me some hasty directions as to my deportment in the emergency. The great wave came. We were again momentarily corked up in an airtight compartment. I wondered the roof was not burst open with the intense pressure that nearly forced the eyes out of my head and made me faint and giddy. Recovering from shock, with a cry of warning from Hua, and a prayer scarcely articulated, we shot like a bomb from a mortar, in the very teeth of a frightful gale. Nothing more was said, nothing seen. The air was black with flying spray. The roar of the elements, more awful than anything I had ever heard before. Sheets of water swept over us with such velocity that they hummed like circular saws in motion. We were crouched as low as possible in the canoe, yet now and then one of these, the very blade of the wave, struck us on the head or shoulders, cutting us like knives. I could scarcely distinguish Hua's outline, the spray was so dense, and as for him, what could he do? Nothing, indeed, but set up a sort of death wail, a few notes which tinkled in my ear from time to time assuring me how utterly without hope we were. One of these big rollers must have lifted us clean over the reef, where we crossed it and we were blown into the open sea, where the canoe spun for a second at the trough of the waves, and was cut into slivers by an avalanche of water that carried us all down into the depths. I suppose I filled it once, but came up in spite of it. Almost everyone has the privilege. When I was clutched by Juan Mano, it made pass to his utilitarian back hair. I had the usual round of experiences allotted to all half-drowned people, a panoramic view of my poor life crammed with sin and sorrow and regret, a complete biography written and read through instead of ten seconds. I was half-strangled, call it two-thirds, for there comes near the truth, heard the water singing in my ears, which was not sweeter than symphonies, not beguiling, nor in the least agreeable. I deny it, in the face of every corpse that ever was drowned, I emphatically deny it. Hua had nearly stripped me with one or two tugs at my thin clothing, because he didn't think that worth towing me off to some other island, and he was willing to float me for a day or two and run the risk of saving me. When I began to realize anything, I congratulated myself that the gale was over. The sky was clear, the white caps scars, but the swell still sufficient to make me dizzy as we climbed one big green hill and slid off the top of it into a deep and bubbling abyss. I found Hua leisurely feeling his way through the water perfectly self-possessed, and apparently unconscious that he had a deck passenger nearly as big as himself. My hands were twisted into his hair in such a way that I could rest my chin upon my arms, and thus easily keep my mouth above water most of the time. My emotions were peculiar. I wasn't accustomed to travelling that fashion. I knew it had been done before. Even there I thought with infinite satisfaction of the Hawaiian woman who swam for forty hours in such a sea, with an aged and helpless husband upon her back. Reaching land at last, she tenderly drew her burden to shore and found him dead. The fact is historical, and but one of several equally marvellous. We floated on and on, cheering each other hour after hour. 
the wind continuing, the sea falling, and anon night coming like an ill omen. Night, they buried us alive, in the darkness, and despair. I think I must have dozed, or fainted, or died several times during that night, for it began to grow light long before I dared to look for it. And then came sunrise, a sort of intermittent sunrise that gilded a shoulder whenever we got to a top of a high wave, and went out again as soon as we settled into the hollows. Homano's eyes were much better than mine, he seemed to see with all his five senses, and the five told him that there was sand not far off. I wouldn't believe him. I think it was excusable for questioning his fallibility then and there. The minute he cried out land, I gave up and went to sleep, or to death, for I thought he was daft, and it was discouraging business, and I wished I could die for good. Juan Mano, what a good egg you were, though it is the bad I usually keep at top of water, they tell me. Juan Mano was right. He walked out of the sea an hour later, and stood on a mound of coarse sand in the middle of the ocean, with a miserable, waterlogged body lying a heap at his feet. The place was as smooth and shiny and desolate as anybody's bald head. That's a nice spot to be merry in, isn't it? And he tried to make me open my eyes and be glad. He said he knew the Great Western would be coming down the way shortly. She'd pick us off of the shore and water and feed us. Perhaps she might. Meantime, we hungered and thirsted as many a poor castle we had before us. It was a good hour for Christian fortitude, beached in the middle of the ocean, shirtless under the sun that blistered her tough skin, eyes blinded with the glare of sun and sea, the sun glowing like brass and burning to flesh already irritated with salt water, a tongue of leather cleaving to the roof of her mouth, and no food within reach, nor so much of a drop of fresh water for Christ's sake. Down with my face into the burning sand that made the very air hop above it. Another night, cool and grateful, a bird or two flapped wearily overhead, looking like spirits in the moonlight. Hoa scanned earnestly on our horizon, noting every inflection in the voices of the wind and waves, voices audible to him, but worse than dumb to me, mocking monotones reiterated for an agonizing eternity. A wise monitor was Hoa Manu, shaming into silence and accursed banishment. Toward the morning, after our arrival at the shore, a owl fluttered out of the sky and fell at our feet, quite exhausted. It might have been blown from Motohilo, and seemed ominous or something, as Kelsey knew what. When it had recovered from its fatigue, it sat regarding us curiously. I wanted to wring its short, thick neck, and eat it, feathers and all. Who objected? There was superstition that gave that land bird its life. It might continue to ogle us with one eye as long as it liked. How the lopsided thing smirked, how the stupid owl face, like a rosette with three buttons in it, haunted me. It was enough to craze anyone. And, having duly cursed him and his race, I went stark mad and hoped I was dying forever. There are plenty of stars in this narrative. Stars, and plenty of them, cannot account for the oblivious intervals, suspended animation, or whatever it was, that came to my relief from time to time. I cannot account for them myself. Perhaps Huaman could. He seemed always awake, always on the lookout, never so patient and painful. A dream came to me after that owl had stared me into stone. A dream of an island in a sea of glass. Soft ripples lapping on the silver shores, sweet airs sighing in a starlit grove, someone gathering me in his arms, hugging me close with infinite tenderness. I was consumed with thirst, speechless with hunger, like an infant. I lay in the embrace of my deliverer, who moistened my parched lips and burning throat with delicious and copious draughts. It was an elixir of life. I drank health and strength in every drop, sweeter than mother's milk, full of the warm tide, unchecked. But was satisfied and sank into a deep and dreamless sleep. The great Weston was plunging her old style, and I swashed in my bunk as of yore. The captain sat by me with a bottle in his hand and anxiety in his countenance. Where are we? I asked. Two hours out from Tahiti, inward bound. How? What? When? etc. And my mind ran up and down the record of the last fortnight, finding many blots and some blanks. As soon as I got into my right mind, I could hear all about it. And the captain shook his bottle and held on to the side of my bunk to save himself from total wreck in the lee corners of my cabin. Why, wasn't I right-minded? I could tell a hawk from a hernshaw. And speaking of hawks, where was a cursed owl? The captain concluded I was bettering and put the physic into the locker so as to give his whole attention to keeping right side up. Well, this is how it happened, as I afterward learned. Great Weston suffered somewhat from the gale at Motuhilo, though she was comparatively sheltered in the inner sea. Having repaired and given me up as a deserter, she sailed for Tahiti. The first day out, in light breeze, they all saw a man apparently wading up to his mill in the sea. The fellow hailed the Great Weston, but as she could hardly stand up against the rapid current in so light a wind, the captain let her drift past the man in the sea, who suddenly disappeared. A consultation of officers followed, 
Evidently, someone was cast away and ought to be looked after, resolved to beat up to the rock, big turtle, or whatever it might be that kept the fellow afloat, provided the wind freshened sufficiently. Wind immediately freshened. Great Western put about and made for the spot where Juan Mano had been seen failing the schooner, but when that schooner passed, he threw himself upon the sand beside me and gave up hoping at last and was seen no more. What did he then? I must have asked for drink. He gave it me from an artery in his wrist, severed by the finest teeth you ever saw. That's what saved me. On came the loose schooner, being up against the wind and tide, while I had my lips sealed to the fountain of life. The skipper kept banging away with an old blunderbuss that had been left over in his bargains with the savages, and one of these explosions caught the ears of Hua. He tore my lips from his wrist, staggered to his feet, and found help close at hand. Too light, they gathered us up out of the deep and strove to renew our strength. They transported us to the little cabin of the schooner, Huamano, myself, and a mincing owl, and swung off into the old course. Probably the Great Western never did better sailing since she came from the stocks than an hour or two of beating that brought her up to the shore. She seemed to be emulating it in the home run, for we went bellowing through the sea in a stiff breeze and the usual flood tide on deck. I lived to tell the tale. I should think it mighty mean of me not to live after such a sacrifice. Juan sank rapidly. I must have nearly drained his veins, but I don't believe he regretted it. The captain said when he was dying, his faithful eyes were fixed on me. Unconsciously, I moved a little. He smiled, and his soul went out of him in that smile, perfectly satisfied. At that moment, the owl fled from the cabin, passed through the hatchway, and disappeared. Juan Manuel lay on the deck, stretched under a sail, while I heard this. I wondered if a whole cargo of pearls could make me indifferent to his loss. I wondered if there were many truer and braver than he in Christian lands. They call him a heathen. It was heathenish to offer up his life vicariously. He might have taken mine so easily, and perhaps have breasted the waves back on his own people, and been fated and sung up as the hero he truly was. Well, if he is a heathen, out of my heart I will make a parable, its rubric bright with his sacrificial blood. Its theme, this glowing text. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for a friend. End of Pearl Hunting in the Pomatis.